But uh, Romans chapters 9, 10, 11, of course, deal with the nation of Israel. Amen. And uh, if you want to understand it uh, as a whole, you would say that Romans chapter 9 deals with Israel's past. Right. Romans chapter 10 deals with Israel's present condition. And Romans chapter 11 deals with Israel's future position. Amen. In general, generally speaking, I know we often use Romans chapter 10 to lead someone to the Lord, and rightfully so. But really, in its context, it's, it's dealing with the nation of Israel in this section of the Bible. And so we're going to read Romans chapter 11. I'll just read a few verses here, probably down to verse 11. So let's stand together if you're able to stand. Follow along as I read. And as I mentioned this morning, I'm going to preach on, on the subject of Israel tonight. Amen. Notice verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Amen. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Notice what we read here. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Amen. Amen. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Amen. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. The Lord. And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But Amen. if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Amen. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them, let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Amen. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. Amen. That's most of us in this room. Jesus. Thank the Amen. Lord for that. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this evening, and I pray, Lord, as I preach the message that I trust you've lead me to led me to preach tonight, that you'd help me. Please fill me with your spirit. I pray that you'd give us understanding as we think of current events today and the place of Israel and what's going on and how this all fits in the Bible. So please lead and direct. I do pray if someone's here tonight and not saved, that they would real, realize and recognize the hour that we are in. Amen. And they would make sure that they're saved yes. now, today. Today is the day of salvation. Thank you. And then for those of us that do know you, Lord, that we would get more busy yes. serving you than ever before. And we ask your blessing and help now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, as you know, over the past several days, we have all... I would imagine all of us witnessed or heard or read about the, and the word that's being used frequently is the unprecedented, and it is, the unprecedented and unprovoked acts of terrorism and aggression on the nation of Israel right. by the terrorist group Hamas. Right. And of course the attack, you know, began on October 8th, attacked by land, air and sea. And as we sit and watch from far off here, we can see that it's nothing less than pure evil what's right. happening. Amen. That's what it is. Amen. As of yesterday, and the numbers are always changing, uh, 1,300 innocent people been, were slaughtered, 3,200 plus have been injured, uh, 100 to 150 hostages have been taken, uh, Jewish women and teen girls have been raped and abused, babies have been beheaded, it is an absolute wicked and evil scene. Well, as a result of what's been happening over the past few days, I, I've been asked by people, I've gotten calls on my cell phone from those, some from within the church, some without the church, uh, that have asked several questions about this. For example, questions like, is this event the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, someone asked. 
Someone else asked, and rightfully so, they said, well, is this what we read of in Psalm 83? Those groups that are there, here they are, we kind of see them. Is that what this, this, these same groups? Uh, others have asked, uh, not me necessarily, but I've heard questions around, is Hamas named in the Bible? They've asked, is this the beginning of Armageddon? Some have asked, is, preacher, is this the end of the world? And others have asked, what should we do? Well, hopefully tonight, I'd like to try to give us a biblical perspective on this and give us the answers that we understand. Not all of them, but at least we understand what's going on. I hope tonight that we'll understand where we are in God's timeline and how exactly does the nation of Israel fit into all of this. And so kind of a teachy type preachy message tonight. I'd like to preach on this subject, understanding the times. It's vitally important that you and I understand the times. And, and I'm not talking about what the latest thing is on TikTok. Okay, I'm talking about where we are on God's calendar. Amen. Now think about this. Israel is one of the tiniest nations in the world. You've heard this, I'm sure, the last few days, and you've probably known this before. It's about the size of New Jersey. It's about 8,000 square miles Yet the nation, this little small nation of Israel, seems to be constantly in the international media headlines. We always hear of something that's going on in Israel. It seems like a place of perpetual controversy. It seems like a place of perpetual conflict and perpetual debate. You hear all these things. Why is that? Why is that? This little nation gets so much media, so much attention from the rest of the world. Well, I'll tell you why. Because of who they are in God's plan. Amen. That's why. Amen. You know, a very wise man once challenged to give evidence that the Bible is divinely inspired. And uh, he replied with this one word answer. Israel. Right. That's what he said. Just look at Israel. Right. You know, often when we think of the end times, we kind of judge things by what's going on in America. We're looking at it wrong. Look to Israel. See what's happening in Israel. And you'll get the most accurate perspective of where we are in God's timeline. And so tonight, I'm gonna, we're going to go through some scriptures. So get ready to go through some things. Uh, let's see if we can understand where exactly are we in God's timetable as we consider the nation of Israel in the Bible. Let's begin with a foundational truth. Number one is the place that God gave to Israel. What is the place that God gave to Israel? Let's go all the way back to Genesis. And we'll get to Genesis 12. I know you're thinking that. But let's look at Genesis chapter 3 for a moment here. Amen. And I want us to think, uh, uh, kind of get an overview, step back, and get a bird's eye view of what God is doing in this world as we see it in the Bible. Of course, in Genesis chapter 3, we have the fall of man. And uh, since the fall of man, it has always been God's desire to redeem mankind Praise to himself. Amen. That's what he wants. He right. loves you. He loves me. He loves all of mankind, everybody. And he desires, he wants all men to be saved. Amen. He always has. That's always been his plan. First right. Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. And so as early as Genesis chapter 3, when man fell, immediately after the fall of man, in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15, God promised that he would provide for mankind a Messiah. He promised he would provide for us the Savior of the world, God himself that would come in man form, who would die for the sins of mankind, so that he could redeem mankind back to himself. If man would simply place their faith in the Messiah, in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we know today, and his sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary, then they're saved. Right. Now we find in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, what is called by theologians the proto-evangelical. There's a nice word for you. Take that home and tell somebody, they'll, they'll think you're really smart. But that's what it is. What it means, it's the first mention of the gospel in seed form. 
Uh, notice we read in Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise thy heel. I'm not going to take that apart, but that is the first mention of the gospel in seed form. God telling man that there's going to be a Savior that's going to come from the seed of a woman, not the seed of man, and he's going to redeem mankind. That's the message for man. Amen. But understand, that message had to be preached and proclaimed to this world. And for the first ten chapters of Genesis, God used individuals to reach mankind with the message of the coming Messiah. Right. If you'd page over uh, to uh, uh, people like uh, Abel and Seth and Enos, uh, Enos and Enoch, uh, look at Genesis chapter 4 and verse, uh, well, let's look at chapter, yeah, chapter 4 and verse 26. Uh, here is a godly line of Seth uh, that's, uh, that God called out, if you will, uh, to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world, the message of the Messiah. And, of course, we read about Seth in verse uh, 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said uh, she hath appointed, she, uh, for God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, who, whom Cain slew. Now notice verse 26. And to Seth, uh, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Notice, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. There it is. They're getting the gospel, the message of the Messiah, out through this godly line of individuals uh, uh, of Abel and, uh, and Seth uh, and Enos. And you could follow it down to, in verse 9 to, uh, to Canaan and to Jared in verse 15, Enoch in verse 19, all the way down to Noah. These individuals were all instruments in the hand of God to proclaim the message of the gospel to a lost and dying world. But we know that mankind as a whole rejected the message. Now go over to Genesis chapter 12. Amen. So in Genesis chapter 12, uh, God uh, changed courses, if you don't mind me saying it that way. In Genesis chapter 12, God now calls out a man by the name of Abraham, and he is going to raise up from the loins of Abraham a nation called Israel. The Jews. Amen. And he gives to this man what is called the Abrahamic Covenant. Amen. By the way, that covenant is still in force today. Amen. And it is an unconditional covenant. Amen. God promised it would continue and that he would do it no matter what. Amen. Notice verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now notice this. And I will, there's a promise, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So let's take that apart a moment. Notice that God promised Abraham that he would make of him a great nation again the nation of Israel. He said that he would bless Abraham and bless the nation of Israel. He said that he would make his name great and that he, would God, would bless those that bless Abraham and the nation of Israel and he would curse those that cursed Abraham and the nation of Israel as well. That's why it's important that we side up with the nation of Israel. And through that nation, notice he says that all the families of the earth would be blessed, uh, making reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and God would use that nation, more later here in a minute, to reach the world through them. Okay? Now, many have summed up this, again, this is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, many, many have summed up this Abrahamic covenant this way. They say that God promised uh, to Abraham a land, a seed, and a blessing. Three things. A land, a seed, and a blessing. So he promised to Abraham, number one, a land. In other words, the promised land. That's the Middle East there. That's the physical land that God says, I am going to give this land completely to this nation, Israel. And God actually described that land, the scope of that land. Turn over a page to Genesis chapter 15 and look at verse 18. 
as God is reaffirming here the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, in verse 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, look how big it is, from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile, by the way, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now that land has yet to be realized. That's going to be realized in the millennium, but it is promised to the nation of Israel. It's not promised to the church, it's promised to the nation of Israel. So God promised them that land. Right. Hasn't happened yet. He also promised to them a seed. In other words, that his seed, the seed of Abraham, would multiply and become a great nation and also a blessing that this nation would universally bless the world. And we know that that would be through the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ would come of the seed of Abraham. He would be born from the Jews. Praise God for that. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas, and his brethren. I won't go all the way down there. But in verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon under Christ are 14 generations. Again, and this was God's oath, this was God's promise to Abraham and the nation of Israel. He promised them unconditionally a land, a seed, and a blessing. And so God raised up this nation, he chose the nation of Israel, and he made the Jews his peculiar, his unique, Amen. his special people. Go see that here in a little bit. Deuteronomy 14, 2 describes it this way, uh, speaking to the Jews, uh, God to the Jews, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Amen. So the Jews have been and still are God's chosen people. Yes, I understand. We'll get to that. They're in a current state of blindness and rebellion. More of that later. But they are still God's chosen people. He has a plan for them. Now you may ask today, well... Well, preacher, why did God choose Israel over all the other nations? Uh, why didn't he choose somebody else? Well, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let's find out why he did. Amen. It's pretty simple. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and notice verse 6. We read God speaking to the Jews again, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any, uh, than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, that's the Abrahamic covenant, he's going to keep his word even if they rebel against him, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen uh, from the hand of Pharaoh, uh, king of Egypt. And so you may not like this answer, but he chose them because he chose them. Amen. He chose them because that's who he chose. And understand what God did. He took the Jews, the people, the nation of Israel, and he placed them right in the center of the world. He placed them right in the midst of all the nations of the world. Ezekiel 5, 5 says this, Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. So this is Israel, the place of Israel in God's plan. They are God's chosen people. Then we see number two, also the purpose God gave to Israel. So why, what were they here for? I mentioned this already. Now understand, God chose the nation of Israel for a reason. Uh, let's consider two things about God's purpose. Number one, God's uh, assigning. What did God assign for them to do? Well, God's desire for the nation of Israel was for that nation to bring glory to God. 
That's what he wanted them to do. Isaiah 46, 13. I bring near my righteousness, it shall not be far off, uh, and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. And so they were raised up by God so that they would bring glory to the God of heaven. But how? How? How would they bring glory to the God of heaven? Well, really simple. By being a people that obeyed his word. Amen. By being a people that were a light of God's righteousness in a dark, fallen world. Right. To be a people that would bring the message of hope through the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, that would come to this earth and die for the sins of the entire world. You see, God wanted the world to see a nation, a people that had God's blessings upon them, uh, that God's love displayed by them, that they would see a people that had God's joy, God's peace, and God's salvation, which would cause the entire world to desire their God. They would say, I want what you have. What is it? And they could tell them about the God of heaven and Amen. bring glory Amen. to God. Amen. That was their assignment. But then let's consider also his, their equipping. God's purpose, they were given an assignment, but God also equipped them to perform that assignment. Amen. Well, how so? Go over to Romans chapter 9. We're back to Romans now. Romans chapter 9. God is going to give to this nation everything they need Amen. to fulfill his purpose in this world. Everything. Right. Hey, we're going to see that here in a moment. Uh, notice Romans chapter 9 and verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, notice, according to a flesh. Amen. Paul was a Jew. He has a burden for the, the people of Israel, uh, the Jews. And notice he describes them in verse 4 and 5. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants? and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. You see, God not only gave them their assignment to make a difference in this world, and to reach this world with the message of the coming Messiah, he also gave them everything they needed to do so. The Old Testament Jew, the nation of Israel, was a very privileged people. Praise the Lord. They had things that none of the Gentiles had at all. Right. You know, the name Israel was not only a national name, it was a name of honor as well. Right. Notice the privileges that are listed here in this passage. He says, who are Israelites to whom it pertaineth, notice the adoption. Right. What does that mean? It means that God adopted them as a nation. They had a special relationship with God that no other nation on the face of the earth had. Right. Hosea 11.1 1 says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. God adopted them as his special people. Right. Then notice the glory. It was the nation of Israel. It was the Jew of the Old Testament that saw firsthand the Shekinah glory of God. They saw it in the tabernacle. Uh, they really wit witnessed it in the wilderness too with the pillar of fire and so forth uh, and the cloud. They saw it in the temple. No other people experienced that on the face of the earth. 1 Kings chapter 8 describes it uh, when uh, Solomon built the temple. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand in the, uh, to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Praise they the saw Lord. firsthand the Shekinah glory of God. Praise the Lord. And notice he says thirdly the covenants. Right. 
Well, those are the covenants, the one I mentioned a moment ago. He gave them promises that he gave to no other people and to no other nation. He gave them the Abrahamic covenant. He gave them the Mosaic covenant, the law, blessings for obedience and cursings for disobedience. Uh, disobedience. He gave them the Palestinian and the Davidic and the New Covenant, which are all amplifications of the Abrahamic Covenant. Uh, don't worry if you don't get that. But the Palestinian Covenant was the land promise. Uh, the Davidic Covenant was the Messiah uh, promise that, uh, that the Messiah would come through the lineage of David. The New Covenant was the promise of forgiveness and restoration of Israel through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that nation, those people had the covenants of God. God. Then he says, and the giving of the law. Who did God give the law to? Well, the Jew. Uh, the, the, he gave the Ten Commandments, of course, to Moses uh, and the Jews. He gave the Old Testament law, his standard of complete righteousness to the Jews. It was the Jews. They were the custodians of God's word in the Old Testament. Imagine the privileges they had. Praise Goes on to say the service of God. What is that? God instructed them on how, how to truly worship him and approach him through the blood, amen, and the sacrifices. Uh, then he, again we read, and the, uh, and the, the promises, uh, uh, the great messianic promises were given to them. They were told when the Lord Jesus Christ would come in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, they were told where he would be born in Micah chapter 5. They were told about his death, his burial, and resurrection. All of those things were given to them. And then they were given notice, the next one is uh, verse 5, uh, the fathers, the great men, the patriarchs of the Old Testament were Jews. Uh, and then lastly, uh, and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, as I said earlier, Jesus Christ came through the lineage of the Jews. What a privileged people. He not only gave them the assignment, but he equipped them with everything they needed to fulfill that assignment. But how'd they do? Well, we'll see that here in a moment. God wanted them to bring forth fruit. Right. You know, the prophet Isaiah kind of alludes to that. Go over to Isaiah chapter 5 quickly. Amen. Isaiah chapter Amen. 5. They were supposed to be a light of righteousness. They were supposed to be uh, lights in a world and bring the message of the coming Messiah right. and bring forth good fruit. Notice this parable. We'll see it again in Matthew later on in the message. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Notice a parable here. He's talking about his beloved. He's talking about a vineyard. And he's saying, I did everything necessary for this vineyard to produce wonderful fruit. Uh, I planted it. I fenced it. I gathered the, st picked the stones out of it. I put the choicest vine in it. I built a tower to guard it uh, and a wine press ready to take care of that fruit and, and produce uh, wine when it comes out non-alcoholic. And, uh, and he looked. He wanted fruit. But what happened? happened? It didn't bring grapes like he wanted. It brought forth wild grapes. What does this mean? Verse 3, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard than I have not done in it? Amen. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Watch this. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts... Amen. is the house of Israel, right. Right. and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. God gave them everything they needed. Right. 
to fulfill their purpose. And they could have fulfilled his purpose, and they would have fulfilled his purpose if they simply remained faithful to God. And God said if they did not, that he would chasten them severely. Severely. The purpose God gave to Israel. So we see, number one, the place God gave to Israel. Number two, the purpose God gave to Israel. Then thirdly, the problem with Israel. So what happened? Well, you've read the Bible. Amen. You know exactly what happened. Right. Instead of staying true to the one true and living God of the Bible, they, they over time, worshipped idols. I'm talking as a nation. There was always a remnant right. of believers in there. I get that. Abraham and I and all them. But as a nation, uh, uh, they began to worship idols. Uh, and instead of being uh, obedient to God's word, they disobeyed. And instead of influencing the world for God, they allowed uh, the world to influence them. They refused to listen to the prophets that God sent uh, year after year, decade after decade, pre preaching to them. They refused to heed God's warnings. Uh, they refused to return to God after he continually chastened them to try to draw them back to him. Uh, I mean, think about it. Uh, the, uh, the elimination of the ten tribes uh, with the Assyrian captivity was an act of chastisement. Before that, the division of the nation into the northern and southern kingdoms, uh, and then the southern uh, uh, Babylonian captivity of 70 years, uh, all of that was the chastening hand of God uh, to try to tell them, come back to me and I'll use you again. Praise the Lord. Amen. But the Jews as a whole and as a nation would not turn back to God. Lord have mercy. And the fi final straw was when the Lord Jesus Christ came Amen. and he came and presented himself to them as their long-awaited Messiah, the one that they should have known about, they, they should have known was coming and why he was coming. And what did they do? The very nation that raised him up took part in nailing him to the cross. And I understand it was a part of God's plan. And saying to Jesus Christ, we will not have this man to rule over us, Luke 19, 14. He came unto his own, the Jews, Amen. and they received him not. Now go over to Matthew chapter 21 quickly. Matthew chapter 21. Amen. Because what we find in Matthew chapter 21 is really Jesus reminding them of Isaiah chapter 5 that I just read a moment ago. Right. Notice in verse 33. Jesus speaking to the Jews, to the chief priests and the elders in the temple. Imagine looking at the very ones he raised up. Amen. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. Does it sound familiar? And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants uh, to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. That was the prophets, by the way. Amen. Verse 36, and again, I'm sorry, again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. Praise the Lord. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Lord, have mercy. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto the ho those husbandmen? Notice how the Jews responded. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men Amen. and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, right. which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Right. Jesus saith uh, unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? Right. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Right. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Amen. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now watch this. And when the Pharisee, and the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Amen. 
But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Christ reminded the Jews of what he said in Isaiah chapter 5. And this was the last straw. It was now time for God to do something. What did he do? God, of course, raised up the New Testament church, which is a body of Jew and Gentiles, now to get the message of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And what did he do to the nation of Israel? Well, he destroyed Jerusalem and handed it over to the Gentiles in 70 AD uh, with the Roman Emperor Titus. uh, And they lost their nation from that point until 1948. Go over to Hosea chapter 3 and verse 5. Hosea chapter 3 describes, and verse 4 and 5, uh, describes this, uh, this time that we're speaking of where the Jews have been set aside. Right. Amen. Hosea chapter 3, and notice verse 4 and 5. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim, afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness. Notice, in the latter days. So the problem with Israel was they did not fulfill what God raised them up to do. And so what did God do? He put the spirit of blindness upon them as a whole and set them aside But can I say this? God's not done with Israel. He's not done with them, which leads me to my last point. What is the plan, number four, the plan of God for Israel? Well, since we're in Hosea, turn a few pages to your right to the book of Amos, Hosea, Joel, Amos, in chapter 9. What is God's plan for Israel? What's going to happen to them? Here it is. It's called restoration. God is going to revert back to the Jew, back to the nation of Israel. When and how? Well, let's read it first. Amos chapter 9 and notice verse 8. There's so many scriptures we could go to that describes the restoration of Israel. But here's one of them. Amos chapter 9 verse 8. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom. That's actually talking about Israel. And I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. Amen. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword which which say, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day, notice that phrase, will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine and the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. And they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. And they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land and they shall no more be pulled out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord. They're going to be back in the land forever, for the rest of this age anyway. When? And how is that going to happen? What is God's plan? Well, here it is. God promised in his word that Israel will be restored back to God. That Israel will turn back to the God of the Bible. That Israel is going to recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And God is going to give them the land that he promised. And Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign in it as the King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, the nation of Israel is going to experience a great spiritual uh, conversion. But. But. It's going to take the seven-year tribulation to accomplish it. Known as the Great Tribulation. You see, Israel's greatest troubles lie ahead. 
Matthew 24, 21, Jesus said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. Amen. Let me explain in briefly. The next event on God's calendar is the rapture. Amen. The rapture of the saints. We read of that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself shall descend. He'll come. Of course, he's going to snatch us away. Uh, by the way, nothing has to happen on God's calendar before the rapture occurs. It can happen at any moment. Uh, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So the next event is the rapture of the saints, after which, understand what's going to happen. All mayhem is going to break out on this earth. The tribulation's going to happen. Imagine what we see today. In that day, the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, is gone. Lord, and man's sin will have no restraints. Right. And as we read in Revelation chapter 6, uh, there's going to be wars and famines uh, right. and natural disasters like this world has never seen before. Amen. Sin will abound. And at that time... The Antichrist is going to be revealed. The man of sin, the son of perdition, uh, uh, he will come as a man of peace. Uh, he will set up a one world government, uh, uh, a, a one world economy, and a one world religion. Uh, religion. Uh, there will be a government of a ten nation coalition, and he will emerge as the head of that one world government. Uh, and he will be the one who will bring the so called peace to the world. Uh, he will be the one that will so-called solve the Middle East problem with a peace treaty in which he will allow the Jews to rebuild their temple. By the way, uh, it's already started. The, the things of the temple, uh, are many, several of them are already built. And he's going to come on the scene as the one that's going to solve this whole Middle East problem that we're seeing here today. And uh, in the midst of the tribulation, though, right. the Antichrist is going to turn on the Jews. Right. He's going to turn on the Jews. He's going to turn on God's people. Throughout the tribulation, many people are going to be getting saved. There's going to be a great revival because of what's happening on this earth. Uh, Jews will be getting saved. They will be evangelizing the world. And of course, he's going to turn on them. He's going to turn on God's people. He's going to demand to be worshipped as God. He's going to force all men to take the mark of the beast and cause all the nations of the earth to turn and go to war against the nation of Israel. It's during this seven year tribulation that the Jews nationally will turn back to God. They will awake out of their slumber and they will recognize Jesus Christ as their Savior. And just as all the nations of the earth, all the nations converge upon, upon Jerusalem, what's going to happen? Jesus Christ is going to return. Go over to Revelation chapter 19 if you would please. Let's rejoice in this return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in verse 11 of Revelation 19, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and, the, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Amen. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flaming fire, flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he, had, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall Rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and wrath of Almighty God. Uh, and as these nations of the earth have turned against God's people and the Jews, uh, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh the name, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. 
I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that, that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet uh, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, uh, which a sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Look at verse, verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him in the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season." And I saw thrones, and they, sat, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Behold, I'm sorry, blessed and holy is he that hath part in, this fir in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You see, when Jesus Christ returns to this earth and he puts down all the opposing armies and judges the nations, he is going to set up his kingdom to rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Uh, and he will be the only one that can bring and will bring peace to this world. Right. The King of kings Praise and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. So I said all that to say this. What we're seeing today is not the end of the world. Amen. It's right. terrible, evil, certainly. But it doesn't mean the world's going to end tomorrow. It's not. It's not the beginning of Armageddon. It is God setting the stage for what is going to take place during the tribulation period. Amen. It is God setting the scene for the Antichrist to be revealed and to offer a solution for this Middle East problem. Right. That's what's happening. Praise the Lord. And you know what that means? We're out of here soon, bro. Amen. We are out of here Praise soon. I believe, and I truly believe this, maybe not in my lifetime, but soon, that this is the rapture generation. Right. How can it not be? Right. Look at what we're seeing. We never would have thought a one world government, a one world monetary system, economy. How can that happen? We're seeing it before our eyes. Amen. It's setting the stage for what's going to happen during the tribulation pe uh, period, uh, which means, again, we are out of here soon. Which means this. If you're, sa if you're not saved, I'd get saved today. Amen. Because this could be our last day on earth. And if you are saved, maybe we need to kind of adjust our priorities a little bit and realize what's important because we're not taking, we're not taking anything with us except people we led to Christ and what we've done for Christ. You see, when this is all said and done, the only thing that's going to matter is what we've done for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important for God's people not to panic, not to bite our nails, Pray for the nation of Israel. They are God's people in blindness to be restored, to be given the land. And thank God that we have been given the privilege of carrying the gospel to a lost and dying world. But our time is short. Let's get busy about what God has given us to do and stop fooling around. Amen.